Who here, raise your hand, if you've ever uh, seen Gary Bernhardt's amazing JavaScript Watt talk. All right, great. Um, this is just going to be that. So um, <laughs> you can leave if you've seen it. Um, no, so his, his JavaScript Watt talk is, uh, is great because it's, it's very short, it's very informative, and it's fun at the same time. So I thought I would try my hand at something similar for Python, and this is what I come up with. So starting with me, of course, um, I've been a Python developer since about 2008, um, mostly working with Python um, and Django. Um, I also love SQL and dogs, long walks on the beach. Um, I currently work uh, at Atlassian on uh, Bitbucket in Austin, just moved down there um, earlier this summer, and I very occasionally update my site, um, kels.tj, shout out to Tajikistan for the sweet TLD. Um, there, there will be some coarse language, so if that bothers you, um, now would be the time to leave. Actually, like five minutes ago would have been a good time to leave. But uh, most importantly about me, um, I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, the longer I do this, the less I understand and the less confident I become. Uh, it's great. It's, it's a great career. Everyone should get involved in it. Um, so sometimes in my, uh, my very important job, um, I get to work on really uh, computationally complex math problems, like you see on the screen here. Um, so I want to know what 3 divided by 4 is. It's a tough problem to solve. Um, obviously, it's 0.75. Everyone knows that. Uh, what? How? 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 What? So it turns out Python assumes that if I'm doing math, I'm doing integer math. Um, if I tell it explicitly, I'm doing float math by making my numbers explicitly floats with uh, dot zero, I will get the correct values. Um, Python uh, has future. Python 2 has a future module that you can import division from. If you do that, you're going to get uh, float uh, math by default, not integer math by default, and you'll get your nice imaginary numbers back. Um, future, however, is, is just a polyfill for Python 3. So if you can use Python 3, do that. Everything works great. It's great. Um, so let's talk about commas. Um, sometimes in my very important job, I get to work on uh, big data. We just got to see some great big data stuff. Um, so you'll see I have a big data structure on the screen here. Um, I have a tuple uh, with one value in it. So I want to get that first value out of my tuple. What? How, how does that work? Well, it turns out that tuples actually don't have a lot to do with parentheses. Parentheses are, uh, are there for us human beings, and um, much like in English, the uh, comma is important. So I don't know if you're familiar with the, the panda bear joke, but that's for grammar nerds out there. Um, the <coughs> parens, or uh, commas rather, do lots of things in Python. Um, they do things like groupings. So if I have a big multi-line string and I have it separated with uh, backslash escape new lines, um, I can actually replace that with a nice uh, uh, list-ish looking thing. But you'll notice uh, no commas. There's no commas in that data structure there. So uh, when I run type against my foo object, I get a string back. Um, commas also unpack arguments. This is uh, something that a lot of people don't know. So if I want to do multi-assignment, I can do a comma b equals one comma two, and I get a equals one and b equals two. I can also do uh, c comma equals three comma. I don't know why you would do something like that. Please don't. Um, but it works, and it, it works, and suggests to you a little more deeply about um, you know how the unpacking works. Uh, Python two, unfortunately, uh, the variable unpacking is not safe. So if I have uh, more values on my uh, right-hand side, then I have um, names on my left-hand side. Um, I actually get a value error. Uh, Python 3, again, fixes this, though. So I can, I can actually do a comma star b, and I end up with a equals the first value popped off of uh, my right-hand side, and the name b refers to just the rest. So hey, look, another reason to use Python 3. Um, let's talk about mutable defaults. Um, how many of you guys have ever written code that looks something like this? I know I have, um, and if you've ever written code that looks like this, you will know what's about to happen. <laughs> so I have a, a function called add a Python. Um, I want it to take a, a variable argument uh, of things, 
and things is going to be a list. Uh, the very first thing that I want to happen is I want to take my list that my function has received and I want to add one value to it and then return it. Easy, right? Uh, so I run my function and I didn't pass it anything, so obviously it comes back with just a list containing one uh, value. I run it again, and what? So um, <clears throat> what happened here? What happened here is that um, when functions are compiled in Python, um, they're compiled only once, right? The, the language is interpreted, but there is a, a compilation step um, where your code is actually compiled into these code objects. So this function has a code object created, and it has a single property. Um, in Python 3, it's called uh, double under defaults. In uh, Python 2, it's uh, func defaults. Um, that data structure is only created one time. It's only created during the compile step. So what you end up with is a data structure that's created once, and then you're just appending to it over and over and over again. Um, the built-in function locals, if you're unfamiliar, can actually shed a lot of light on this. And um, you'll notice as we go through this, I, I suggest um, some tools that maybe seem a little bit overblown for the problem, but they're good tools to understand. So locals, yes, it's a little bit overblown to like try to understand why my mutable default is getting mutated when I mutate it. Um, but it, it's actually a great tool. So if you call the locals function or print the result of the locals function, um, you'll actually see all the variables that are in scope. So inside of that function, if I put print locals, I would see um, that defaults contains many values uh, the more I, I run the, uh, the function. Um, yeah, I, and obviously mutations to these defaults persist between function calls because, like I said, uh, we only get our default object created one time at compile. Um, let's talk about chain comparisons. How many people here know uh, what this evaluates to? Oh, there's one confident guy, I like that. Uh, false is false is false is obviously uh, false. Uh, what? The, what happened here? So this is actually something called chain comparisons. Um, and chain comparisons are actually really awesome. So what's not obvious is that if you were to break that down into multiple statements, those statements are then implicitly joined with ands. Um, so that statement, false is false is false, actually evaluates to something more like false is false and false is false, which is true, obviously. Um, it actually enables this great behavior, though. So this top code snippet here, if day greater than or equal to end date and day less than or equal to end date, it's kind of a little bit clunky. You can actually rewrite that as end date. I, did I switch my operators? I don't know. doesn't matter. This code isn't real. Um, <laughs> the... Uh, Yes, I, I, can, I can run all of my comparisons all at once um, without having to, to join them together with ands and restate uh, the left-hand side. Um, so another crazy overblown tool, um, can you guys see that okay? I, I chose humor over visibility, so I hope that really is working out well for you guys. Um, another really super overblown tool um, for debugging something like this is um, DIS. You guys ever use DIS? Show of hands, anyone? Um, so what this actually allows you to do is actually see the bytecode. So um, if you can see at all on this top line here, um, I'm calling the built-in function compile, and I'm passing it a string of code that I want to compile, and I'm telling it um, the compile mode is eval. That's mostly what it will be if you're ever doing something like this. So um, you don't necessarily have to know what that last argument is. But um, compile then takes that string and um, takes that compile mode and compiles it into a code object. That code object actually um, contains all of the bytecode that would be executed. So if we compare the bytecode of false is false is false and the bytecode of A less than B less than C, we can actually see that the bytecode is almost identical. Um, there's, there's a couple of different things that are happening. Um, and the great thing about uh, bytecode is it's sort of like using strace on your computer. You don't have to know what everything is doing to kind of figure out what's going on there. And you'll get better at it as you go, and you'll understand more. Uh, so let's talk about object identity. So uh, A, we will assign to uh, a sweet number, like 1337. In, any inside joke uh, getters in here? That's a good one, right? Um, so A is B, oh, that's false. 
well, that makes sense, right? Because it's object identity. A is not B, they just happen to be uh, names that share the same values. Okay, so um, how many people here think they know what this evaluates to? <laughs> All right, some people who know some stuff about CPython in here. Um, <clears throat> so A equals 256, B equals 256, exactly the same, no tricks as uh, uh, the previous example, and that evaluates to true. What, why? The, uh, this gets worse, <laughs> so, so just buckle up. So if I define a class, and I give that class a method, uh, say hello, and it prints Haya. This is, again, this is very indicative of the important work we're doing at, at Bitbucket. Um, if I then run the ID function, so the ID function is a built-in that will return um, the ID of that object. So when, when the interpreter um, compiles your code objects, it assigns IDs to them, and then it passes these ID references all over the place. Um, so obviously, uh, those things, that, that thing is the same, right? Foo.hello, the method of the class foo is the same thing. Um, however, if I uh, compare foo.hello is foo.hello, uh, they aren't the same. So, so wh what happened there? Why, why was that so weird? Well, it turns out um, that that is actually sort of expected. And this is another, another example of a weird thing that when you dig into it a little bit more, you actually understand a little bit more about the implementation, which is good. Um, so the, the ID function um, gets the, uh, the code object memory address um, and returns it to you. Well, it turns out that CPython only guarantees that IDs won't be reused for the lifetime of an object. So if my object were to be garbage collected and then I were to run the ID function again, I'm going to get the same ID back, but they're not the same reference. Um, so in that example there, you can see that I've rewritten this a little bit differently where I've assigned a uh, equals foo.hello and b equals foo.hello instead of calling foo.hello is foo.hello. And we'll see that evaluates to false. And then the ID of those two objects also evaluates to false. So the first time that I, that I ran that, if we back this up, um, in one line I called id foo.hello and id foo.hello again which just so happens to return the same numeric value. However, they are not identical objects and those objects are actually gone. So by the time the first ID has finished executing, the second ID starts executing and uh, or the, the first comparison to foo.hello and the second comparison foo.hello versus the ID function. The ID function has called foo.hello, gotten the ID and then killed the object. So they actually are not the same thing. Um, in that case, whereas in this case, uh, you can see the ID is also false as long as we use a reference instead of um, directly comparing the two things. Um, important notes, the is operator tests for identity, not equivalence. So um, when you call is, you are doing something usually to, uh, similar to a is, or, uh, ID A equals ID B. Um, this was a case where that is explicitly not true don't assume that will ever happen to you. It probably won't. You probably don't do things like this. Um, so uh, this, this what is also a little bit of a, a, a repel slash CPython detail. Um, the first example, I should have had that right after this. This first example, I just realized I never explained this at all. I just cruised right past it and hoped nobody cared. Um, so where 1337, is 1337 was false in the previous example. It's true for 256. Well, the reason that is, is because when CPython starts up, um, it actually caches uh, a, a bunch of integers. It caches the most commonly used integers, or what it considers to be commonly used integers, which are negative five to 256. So if you compare two values, they're actually constructed when CPython starts and then cached the whole time CPython is running. Um, that would not work in PyPy. So if you were to do that in PyPy, the ID of an integer always returns uh, itself. So it would, it would have different behavior. So see Python de detail. Um, the, yeah, and, and the other, oh, <laughs> look at that, it's right there. The, uh, um, yeah, the, uh, the ID example don't do that. I don't, I, I'm trying to think of an, a, a case in which you would be comparing the identity of, uh, 
of uh, class methods, but yeah, you probably won't. So you're unlikely to run into that anywhere, really. Um, so let's talk about mutable aliasing. Um, you may have heard me throw around the, uh, the terms name and value. Um, those are actually really super important in Python. So um, on my left side of this, uh, this statement here, I have a name, and on my right side, I have a value. When I um, use the equal signs, I'm simply applying a value to my name. So um, I want to have a separate list of, uh, of these numbers, so I'm just gonna call that other numbers. And I wanna actually add some stuff to other numbers. Um, and of course, um, numbers is still one, two, what? How did that happen? The, uh, <coughs> the easy mnemonic here is that um, assignment never copies data. So just like I was saying, uh, names uh, apply, uh, or the equal sign applies a value to a name, it does not copy the data to that name. So uh, the mnemonic here is assignment never copies data, assignment never copies data, and assignment never copies data. It's easy to remember, right? It's very catchy. Um, names refer to values, and assigning one name to another name simply creates an alias that refers that name to the original value. Um, and you might be thinking to yourself, oh, I've been doing this for years. No one ever gets this wrong. <clears throat> but uh, I believe everyone in here has probably written something like that first function at some point in time. And it's really confusing if you're a beginner. And even when you're not a beginner, you may only understand, I know not to do that. I don't exactly know why not to do that. Um, so yeah, this, this example here, I'm gonna go ahead and iterate for s in stuff. I'm gonna violate a bunch of rules here. I'm gonna uh, attempt to mutate my list while iterating it. That's also bad, don't do that. Um, but in this case, I'm gonna say um, the, uh, yeah, so for s in stuff, s equals s plus one, and then obviously that did nothing because uh, these, are, these are just names that have references to values, not copying data by assigning. Um, the, um, yeah, the, the takeaway there is, is basically, uh, go watch this other talk that I have linked at the end of this, but, uh, the, the Ned Batchelder gives a great talk on, on Python names and values and, um, he'll break down, you know, exactly how, like, the, the for statement there is actually doing some, um, some assignment under the covers and, um, it'll all make sense. So, why does any of this matter? Um, to me, this, uh, this matters because having a better sort of systems level understanding um, of your programming language is really the only chance that any of us ever has of um, having any idea of what we're doing. <laughs> um, anytime you find a little quirk, um, anytime you find a bug in your code that was unexpected, um, I challenge you to really just dig into it and get as deep as you can and figure out like, you know, am I just being dumb? Is there a concept, a core concept that I don't understand? Do I not understand, um, you know, enumerate? Or am I missing some built-in that I don't know about? Um, and more importantly, this was just a really good excuse to search for stupid pictures on the internet, so. Um, that's all I've got for you guys. Uh, we've got like three minutes, two minutes for Q&A if anyone has any questions. Um, and then other than that, uh, this, these slides will be up on my website, kels.tj, um, in the next hour or so. Um, and if you feel like typing down these URLs, you can. Um, but yeah, these are some, some really awesome talks that'll, that'll get you a little bit deeper without totally blowing your mind and having to know a ton about the specific C implementation and all that fun stuff. So any questions? Yes. 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 Good question. Anyone else? All right, great, because I think we have like 30 seconds left. Thanks, guys. <laughs>